It is really a pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Denny Martin. Uh, Denny is from the uh, Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, Denis is the head of the Visceral Lishmaniasis program at DNDI, uh, and some of the work that he's been doing and the systems that he's put in place are really quite impressive. And today, Denis will talk about what DNDI has been doing, I think not only in the area of leash, but probably in terms of some of their global partnerships. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Denis Martin. Denis? Thanks, Kish, for this uh, very warm welcome, even though it must be said that I've not been your first choice to deliver this presentation, because initially this pre presentation should have been given by Jana Armstrong, DNDI's director of our U.S. office, and I may understand Kish's choice, which is because she is much more charming than I am, That's <laughs> and definitely I cannot compete on, uh, on these grounds. Oh, no, you're pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so basically in the, in the uh, uh, forthcoming minutes, I will try to cover obviously a lot of, uh, of topics and uh, trying basically to highlight whatever DNDI is trying to do in setting up basically partnerships, but maybe more than trying to set up partnerships, to review what DNDI has delivered over time and what basically we can still expect to deliver through partnerships. Because partnership, I would, I would say, is a, a very trendy word nowadays. Everyone is willing to partner with everyone, public, with private, academics, with industrial, and, and that's great. But on the other end, maybe we should not forget the final goal of all these partnerships, and as Nigel mentioned in his presentation, at the end of the road, we have patients suffering from neglected diseases. And basically, you see on, on that slide, it's this charming young girl. Basically, it's a picture I took in Shyam Sundar's hospital two years ago in Muzafarpur in northern India. And this young girl was suffering from, from VL, and she was included in a, one of our phase three trial in India. And I'm a scientist, I'm not a, a medical doctor, and basically I spent two days in, uh, in Muzaffarpur. And I don't want to say that it has been basically a shock to me, but then you have a direct contact with people suffering from one of these so-called neglected disease. And basically, we all have to keep this type of picture in mind. Whatever we are trying to do is not for the sake of money, it's not for the, the, the sake of ego making publication or, raise, or trying to make money if you work in the private system, but it is to take care of these people. And basically, if, basically you, you wish to remember one take-home message from my presentation, please, that's the only one I would like you to, to keep in mind. Well, why neglected diseases? Basically, you all know these, uh, these numbers. Basically, the world pharmaceutical market is in billions, and the amount which is devoted to overall neglected disease is fairly, fairly small. To the extent that close to 99% of new drugs are outside of the field of neglected diseases. So, basically, over a period of about 30 years, only, roughly speaking, 20 drugs have been developed for neglected diseases. Again, ranking, and I don't like to show too many numbers, but they are important and they also justify all the partnerships we are trying to, uh, to set up. If you look the, at the leading causes of DALIS, which is basically disability adjusted life years, you could see that neglected diseases are lying fairly high in that, in that ranking, and it does further justify further investment in this field. What is needed to fight neglected dis tropical diseases? Basically, again, very um, black and, and white approach. We have large-scale intervention, again, the type of, inter of intervention which has been again mentioned by, uh, by Nigel, large-scale intervention 
for these type of diseases, where the outcome which is expected is a rapid impact with the key factor, which is to improve access to this drug, versus what we call case management and development of new tools for some of the diseases DNDI is working on, like sleeping sickness, Chagas disease, or leishmaniasis, where we are dealing with more focused intervention. DNDI, again, um, four main diseases we are working on, malaria, and I will say a few words on that, on that disease, but the three core diseases on which DNDI is investing are visual leishmaniasis, again, sleeping sickness, or human African trypanosomiasis and Chagas disease. I'm not going to review basically the, the main features of all these diseases, but I would say the first one, sleeping sickness, in, is known by everyone. Basically, it's, an, it's a disease which is re restricted to some fossa in, uh, in Africa. It's a lethal disease. It has mainly two main uh, forms, two, form, two main stages. The first one, which, which is characterized and it's almost asymptomatic, fever and headaches, like a lot of tropical diseases. And the second stage, where basically the parasites manage to enter the, uh, the brain, and which is basically the most severe, severe form of the, of the disease, leading to sleep disruptions, paralysis, mental deterioration. And it's through basically this phase that uh, this disease has been uh, nicknamed sleeping, sleeping sickness disease. And what is definitely needed for this type of disease is, again, a safe, effective and practical, feel adapted stage two treatment. Visual leishmaniasis. And the first striking difference between VL and, and sleeping sickness is the, basically the geographic, geographical repartition, where you can see that this disease is endemic in northern India, in eastern Africa, and also in South America. And again, this is to me quite an, even an unknown disease. When I joined the NDI four years ago, basically, to be honest with you, I never heard the word leishmaniasis. I mean, it was not my field of expertise. So not only it's neglected, but it is also unknown. I mean, if you talk, talk with friends around you and you say, well, I'm working on leishmaniasis, well, I'm sure that you could get some strange questioning about what type of disease you are going to talk about. Again, in terms of need, what is needed is an oral treatment with a good safety profile, low cost, that's something again we are going to, to discuss later on, and short course treatment. Chagas disease, that's another tricky, tricky disease, uh, which is again endemic in, uh, in most uh, South American countries. And it is called the, the silent killer because it can remain basically silent, silent without clinical symptoms for many, many years before basically you start getting the clinical symptoms like cardiomegalia. So it's a disease which is difficult to treat just because of the lack of symptom and it does pose problems to run clinical trials for this disease in the absence of symptoms. Neglected diseases basically what are the current limitation of the existing drugs? In most cases you are, we are facing resistance because these drugs have been used in inappropriate manners for many, many years. In most cases, we are dealing with toxic drugs. Keep in mind that most of these drugs have been, have been developed years back for, in some cases, other pathologies than the ones they are supposed to, to treat. In other cases, they are expensive, and then we will talk about omisome in, in leishmaniasis. It's a wonder treatment, but it's awfully expensive. Painful, this is one of the main drawbacks of the existing sleeping sickness treatment. Difficult to use, IV infusion. I mean, in the field in Africa or in India, it's far from being ideal. And in other cases, I mean, it's more or less a legal issue where these compounds are just not registered in the endemic countries. So what is the DNDI model? DNDI is a, was and still is a small organization which has been created in 2003, so it's still fairly, fairly young. It's a not-for-profit organization and we have been created by seven uh, main partners in India, Kenya, Malaysia, Brazil, 
two French institutions, and I would like to pay credit to Médecins Sans Frontières, not just only because they have been the, one of the founders of this organization, but because also they provided financial support at the beginning of the organization. And part of the Nobel Prize MSF won in 1999 was devoted to create and to help functioning uh, DNDI. So we are based in Geneva. We have also uh, offices in, uh, in Malaysia, in India, Kenya, and, and Brazil. And obviously, we have an office in the uh, USA. It's not because the US, USA is affected by neglected diseases, even though we could discuss about that. But uh, basically, it's for fundraising uh, opportunities in that, uh, in that country. So the, the vision is definitely to be patient needs driven. It's virtual. It means that me and my colleagues are sitting in, uh, in Geneva, which means that without partners, without people actually working either in labs or in the field, basically DNDI would not be efficient. Objectives of DNDI. You see, when I joined DNDI and uh, I, I was reading the um, business plan and I was reading that DNDI is willing to deliver six to eight new treatments by 2014. Based on my experience in the industry, I say, well, people are dreaming. I mean, this is not achievable. I mean, it's such a small period of time. How could we develop six to new treatments? At the same time, DNDI had the will to establish a very robust pipeline for future needs. <coughs> Accordingly, DNDI had also the, the will to strengthen capacity in endemic countries and last but not least, to also raise awareness to increase public responsibility. So very ambitious goals for a very small organization. So partnerships. Partnerships, again, if you look at this, uh, at this map, at, uh, which was built in 2009, well, basically, we had, roughly speaking, 200 partners worldwide in different fields, from pharma to CROs to biotech to government. And maybe one item I would like to throw for later discussion is what is the ideal number of partners that we should bring together in one given field to be as efficient as we can? And I don't pretend to have the answer. But this is, to me, something I've seen over the five or four, three to five last years with more and more people willing to enter into certain fields in uh, neglected diseases. And I'm just, again, throwing the point of quality versus quantity as an open question for further debate. Partners throughout the world, well, it's a, it's a worldwide map, and you see dots, dots everywhere. And as far as I'm concerned, for, for Lishmaniasis, I have partners, obviously, in, uh, in India, in Africa, in the US and down now to New Zealand. And again, that's the reality because we had uh, selected partners, again, on certain criteria I'm going to, to describe, but it means also it does make my life quite complex having to deal with partners in so many different places in the, in the world. So again, DNDI, despite the fact that uh, we have ambitious goals, we tend also to be pragmatic. So, if you look at that map from basic research to, to access, the will of DNDI is to be definitely a leader in the first phases, research and development, without forgetting the last one, which is access. All, everything we are doing will be worthless if once a drug is registered, no one is taking care of making this drug available to patients. But again, DNDI has taken the approach to say, well, we have to be leader in some fields and we have to be facilitator in others. And that's a choice we made that we are perfectly conscious that access is very important, but basically we will not be the leaders at that stage, just because, I mean, we are a small organization and we have to rely either on governments or other organizations which are better set than we are to run this uh, last, uh, last phase, phase of, uh, of development. Portfolio. We are an R&D-based organization, so we have to build a portfolio. And again, in a nutshell, we have short-term projects, mainly clinical projects, which is basically what can we do with the existing drugs 
And the approach we have taken so far for the, at least for the two diseases, HAT and, uh, and VL, is to say, well, let's try to see whether we could combine two of the existing drugs in order to improve compliance and to, re to reduce the potential risk of resistance. Medium term is what I would call opportunistic approach. Do, can we access what we call low-hanging fruits? compounds which basically have been already partially developed on which we have some a priori knowledge, meaning that the road to uh, basically to develop, uh, to develop them for one of our diseases will be shorter. And then basically longer term uh, approach that I'm going to, to describe later on. Well, again, that's a very busy, busy map. And again, I don't want you to, to read it, but Again, it is a good illustration on whatever DNDI has been able to achieve so far from project which has already been completed in the field of malaria with basically two combination therapies made available to, to patients down to basically early discovery where basically we have capacities now to screen libraries in order to identify potential hits and leads to become uh, new chemical entities for one of our diseases. Again, as I said, uh, ambitious goal, but in a way, so far, we are on the right track with, again, three combination therapies delivered, the two I was mentioning for malaria and one for HAT, combining two of the existing drugs, lowering basically the, the burden of, of treatment by combining these two drugs. In terms of medium term goal, well, we have, as I said, ongoing trials in both in, uh, in Africa and in India. And in some cases, like in India, we are already making recommendations on the type of combinations. And I'm sure that Sam Sundar will uh, further develop on, on that aspect later in the, in the day. So basically, this is a first step forward in, uh, in the direction we, we reach to go. And obviously, for the more or less advanced project, the, the risk of failure is, is higher, but there is hope on the, on the road. Again, that's an illustration of these achievements. And again, partnership. I wish to highlight the fact that for malaria, uh, we did have a very strong relationship with, uh, with Sanofi, Sanofi Aventis nowadays. And being from this uh, dark side of the, of the fence, because again, I've spent 20 years of my life in industry and part of it at, uh, at Sanofi, I wish now to say that the landscape has changed as far as big farmers are concerned, at least in Europe. It's less true in Northern America, but people even in industry now realize that basically they cannot stay any longer outside of the field of lingnecled diseases. Doesn't mean that everything is rosy, but things are moving again into the, the, right, uh, the right direction. For basically, um, for uh, the second malaria treatment, we have a partnership with Brazil and India. So again, you see worldwide col uh, collaboration with other institutions. And basically for, uh, for the combination therapy for sleeping sickness, again, Sanofi plus uh, NGOs and local uh, government as well as uh, WHO. So again, uh, if I summarize the, the three diseases and the, the successes for sleeping sickness, I covered already that part. Now, basically, if we, if we go one step at a time, clinical trials in Africa, obviously, this is a challenge, mainly for sleeping sickness. I was mentioning small foresight in remote areas which are politically unstable, so, I mean, it's definitely a challenge. Patients are there. They are difficult to, to access. So that's definitely a challenge, and that's why, back uh, to partners. Again, that's uh, just a picture of the situation people had to, to face in some cases. The only way to reach patients was to go on foot because roads were just either non-existing or not practical. So in order to be able to run clinical trials for sleeping sickness, we did rely and develop capacities in different countries in Sudan, Chad, Democratic Republic of, uh, of Congo, and Republic of, of Congo, as well as uh, Uganda and Angola. So that's definitely one of the potentially best examples of building a partnership with basically local institutions. 
that and it's only through that route that again new chemical entities can be actually tested and validated in the field Moving basically upstream, we just have a new chemical entity in phase one for sleeping sickness, fexinidazole. And again, this is another good illustration of a drug which has been initially developed in the 80s by Oxt in, uh, in Europe and abandoned for strategical reasons at that time, and in a way which has been, I would say, rediscovered by, uh, by DNDI, further developed, and which is now entering and completing phase one, and hopefully we should be able to enter phase two any time next, uh, next year. And it's, uh, you see the, the structure of this, uh, of this compound. I mean, safety in phase one is good. So far, we didn't get any, any red, uh, red signal, so we are hoping to further develop this, uh, this brand new drug. Again, moving still upstream in terms of uh, earlier discovery, we have again a collaboration with a biotech uh, company named Anacor, located in Palo Alto in California, uh, which has developed over time a specific type of chemistry based on boron instead of carbon. So each of their molecules bears a, a boron atom. And we, we set up a collaboration with them in, uh, in 2008 with a main focus on sleeping sickness to, to start with, and you will see later on on, uh, on VL. And that's basically the, the molecule we are just pushing now in uh, what we call the preclinical stage. So we are going to assess mainly the safety uh, aspect of this molecule as well as trying to scale it up. And uh, again, it's, uh, it's chemistry and, and, and biology. This is basically the, one of the compounds we got from Anacor. And this is the molecule you, we are finally developed with some basically improvement in terms of PK profile in terms of brain penetration. Because again, keep in mind that what we wanted to do for this type of drug is to have a, a drug efficient against stage two. So it had to penetrate the, the brain. And again, very busy slide. Keep just maybe one thing <coughs> which is right here. The two curve, you have basically the plasma concentration over time and you have the brain concentration over time. And this red line is the minimum inhibitory concentration. So at least over 24 hours in an animal model, we are miles away above the MIC, which means we have a good predictor if, again, human being behave like mice, which is still a bold assumption, uh, that we may have a drug which would be efficient against stage two. Chagas. Again, uh, Short-term goal to have a pediatric formulation on benzinazole, which is one of the very few drugs uh, which is act active, at least in early stage uh, phase of, uh, of Chagas. And we are working with uh, basically uh, partners in Brazil as well as in, uh, in UK. And again, moving again upstream, we have also a consortium uh, based mainly in Australia trying again to find new chemical entities to treat this, uh, this disease. Likewise, partnership, I was mentioning that the, the field was moving forward. We have now a partnership with uh, ESI, and we have the freedom to operate on one of these azoles as a clinical candidate, and which uh, supposedly will enter a clinical trial next year in South, uh, in South America. Again, pediatric benzinazole, back to the needs of the patient. Why, basically, is the NDI interesting, interested in developing a pediatric formulation of this drug? Just because today, what people are doing, they are crunching tablets to make, basically, powder, put the powder in envelopes in order for the, the parents to give the powder back to the children. So you could imagine that having a powder in an envelope, I mean, both in terms of compliance and doses, it's far from being ideal. So basically that's through this basically field information that DNDI decided to become involved in this game of making a pediatric formulation of an existing drug. Again, platform. If we wish to, uh, to run clinical trials in, uh, in South America, we need also to rely on, on, local, uh, on local partners. So this is one of the latest, so it's not operational yet, but we have now a, a team in, uh, located in Brazil running basically this operation, having, setting the, the network to have the capacity to test any new drug in the forthcoming months. VL. Well, that's the topic I'm supposed to know something about. Uh, Again, 
I mentioned combination therapies, and we will go upstream towards uh, development of a new high throughput screening system. Again, repetition, but it's important. Clinical trials, either completed or ongoing, trying to combine two existing drugs. It's almost completed in, uh, in Asia, it's underway in Africa, and definitely it will start in uh, South America. Not this year, it was planned to start this year, but uh, actually it will start any time in 2011. Keep in mind that for LISH, we have uh, three main drugs existing. Ambisome, which is a, a very sophisticated formulation of amphotericin B, and, and Kish obviously knows something about how to formulate amphotericin B. Uh, the, the drawback of this formulation, it's an IV formulation, and it's very, very expensive. And again, uh, Dr. Sunda will talk more about this uh, drug. Miltefosin. Miltefosin has been developed as an anti-cancer drug, so it has never been properly developed as an anti-Lishmania drug, and it has all the side effects you can expect from an anti-cancer drug. Paromomycin, likewise, works, but it's not without side effects. And again, the trials have been completed at the end of last year, and recommendation to the local authorities are ongoing. And again, partners, there is a list of partners there. Again, I have to pay credit to all these people and again to Dr. Sunda. Again, without them and without their commitment, uh, everything we would try to do would be worthless. Africa, again, it's, uh, it's ongoing. Uh, and again, this situation of running clinical trials in Africa, I mentioned the situation for, uh, for sleeping sickness, it's almost as bad for, for leash. I mean, we need to access patients. So we had also to, to build actually some physically some, uh, some sites in order to be able to run clinical trials. And again, the uh, main countries which uh, basically are involved are uh, in Sudan, Ethiopia, Kenya, and uh, Uganda. And obviously it's not DNDI's facilities, it's partners of DNDI, as well as with uh, other institutions like WBO Show, IOWH, or even uh, STI, which is based in, uh, in Basel, Switzerland. Again, to give you an idea of where we started from and what basically we managed now to have built, physically speaking, in, uh, in uh, basically in Gonda, in, uh, in Africa. Okay, partnership achievements uh, in terms of clinical trials now. Well, as a, as a scientist, what can, or as scientists, what can we do to find and develop new chemical entities? Classical way is obviously to access libraries and to screen them. It means that we need to access these libraries. Again, back to the, the collaboration to, uh, with big farmers, where I would say the more innovative uh, libraries are lying. I mean, all the public libraries have more or less been explored, and unfortunately, I mean, they never delivered really interesting hits or leads. So that's basically one key of the of the success, either uh, big farmers or biotechs. And biotechs, I would say, and I'm looking at uh, Andrew. There are not too many biotechs still willing today um, to enter this field. And obviously, I mentioned Anacor, and I would like also to mention Ico today. I mean, these people are still too rare in the field. And I'm sure that, again, that's a call which should be passed forward. I mean, we would need more biotechs to be involved in this field. And so far, most CEOs of biotechs are still reluctant to, in a way, to give free access to their jewels. So that's, again, something we all have to work on in terms of, again, building partnerships. HEH, high throughput screening, well, it seems to be granted for a lot of diseases. I mean, it existed for, uh, for sleeping sickness. It didn't exist for VL or Chagas, which means that when I had to screen compounds for VL, I had to rely on manual screening, which means that we, within one lab, I was able maybe to screen, one on, one, let's say, 50 to 100 compounds a month. Well, at that rate, in terms of exploring chemical diversity, it could take ages. So we did work with, um, with NCT Pasteur in, uh, in Korea, uh, which has developed and validated a high throughput screening based on the intracellular form of the parasite, which is the relevant model we have to work on. And now they have the capacity and they, they screened a first public library of 200,000 compounds in two months. 
So 50 a month versus, roughly speaking, 100,000, we are changing scale. Is it a, a route to be further explored? Again, it could be open for discussion, but to me, it's a major breakthrough. And nowadays, they are also validated the same type of tool for Chagas disease. How could we drive a research project without knowing what is, again, the final goal? And the final goal to me is the target product profile, which is basically what is the ideal drug profile we would like to develop. And if you read this, as a scientist, I read it fairly quickly. What we want to have is a drug which is efficacious, safe, cheap, and easy to use. That's it. Easy to say, <laughs> much less easy to realize. But that's still, this is my roadmap. And that's where basically we also need the input from people in the field. If I develop a fancy formulation, because I forgot one factor, which is cost, a very fancy formulation, and achieving a, tr a treatment course cost of $1,000, well, you can forget it. No one in India or in Africa could afford to pay such an amount of money. So back to DNDI, uh, how are we organized to uh, basically to face all these uh, challenges? We have basically three diseases and we have an early stage discovery which is transversal to the three diseases and then we are organized by disease with basically uh, head of programs or project managers leading one of these uh, diseases and trying to move molecule from the early stage up to a drug status. And for that again, partnership, uh, you heard about them for sleeping sickness. Uh, our main partners are located in the US, in uh, North Carolina and, and New York with Synexis and Pace University. For Chagas, it's mainly based in, uh, in Australia and South America. And for VL, and uh, quite a natural choice, was to work in, uh, in India with uh, two key partners, Advenus uh, Therapeutics, which is a biotech located uh, mainly in Bangalore, and a public Indian institution, which is uh, CDRI, located in, uh, in Lucknow, which is the southeastern part, uh, southeastern, yeah, southeast of, uh, of Delhi, in the northern part of, uh, of India. What are the, the challenges we have to face for, for VL? And I take VL just a, as an example of all the difficulties we are facing for the, the three diseases. But for VL, we have one first difficulty, which is we are dealing with an intracellular parasite. And this bug, as I used to say, is fairly clever, is hiding itself in a macrophage. And if you think about what a macrophage is supposed to do, it's really the worst environment you could select to live into. So it means that if these bugs are able to live and, and repli replicate in such an environment, it means that the drugs we have to design have to be in a way nasty enough to enter the macrophage, do their job without killing the rest of the other human cells. The in vitro and in vivo models are still rate limiting, despite what I said regarding HTS. I mean, the in vivo model mainly are quite difficult to set. <coughs> the, the number of chemical classes which has been so far investigated is fairly small, which means we don't have a large access to chemical diversity. And last but not least, there are not too many players in this field. I was mentioning earlier on quality versus quantity in terms of partnerships. But in the field of leash, I mean, you could name the, the active group in the field, mainly on the research part, using your two hands. Is it good? Is it bad? This is factual. It means that, again, the number of classes which has been thoroughly investigated remains too low, to my, uh, to my opinion. Right, partnership. Again, trendy word, as I was saying. To me, a partner is not a contract research organization. When I have to select a partner, obviously, I have to select a partner based on the expertise they are going to provide to the team, but also to the commitment. And I would say that without commitment of the partners, it will end up into a failure. In other words, if you rely only on the basis of fee for service, you will not reach success. You will get what you pay for. And this is not going to be enough. 
So what I do expect from a partner, as far as commitment is concerned, is also scientific input. It's not only hands that we are paying for. And the fact that we are working with partners in endemic countries does make a difference. When I work with my partners in India, I know the feeling of these people. I know that I can rely on them not only for their expertise, but for the hard work and the commitment they are going to provide and put into the, into the project. So again, to me, this is a take-home message. Collaboration should go over and beyond money. Otherwise, again, that's my strong opinion. We will end up in something which will be run for ages without achieving much. Again, I may pass that slide. It's just, again, a, a summary of how we are organized with uh, the two main partners, Advinus and CDRI, moving early compound to the, the preclinical uh, pre stage through classical approaches, medicinal chemistry, uh, parasitology assessment, DMPK assessment later on, toxicology assessment, nothing new uh, behind that, uh, that slide. One thing I wish to, uh, again, to pay credit for is the fact that Two of these consortiums, namely the Sleeping Sickness one and the VL one, are partially funded by the, the Gates Foundation. And that's something I will conclude on later on. Uh, money is obviously still a, a key factor of, uh, of success. Quickly, a bit of, of chemistry. That's the main series we investigated at uh, DNDR with, uh, with time. And again, to maybe to illustrate the, the difficulties, we, we spent about eight, 18 months on one series, which is the, the quinoline series, which uh, had been identified by one French group uh, led by Alain Fournay in, uh, in Paris, the quinoline series. And, and in a nutshell, 18 months of work, 300 new molecules synthesized, and at the end of the road, no clinical candidate. Just again to illustrate the difficulty and the energy and resources we have to put if anyone has the will to take a new chemical entity to try to optimize it in order to move it to the, the final stage. Again, uh, a quick summary of one of our lead compounds. Everything, again, goes beyond plain efficacy. We have to assess safety, we have to assess PK, and I just put that slide up to see, well, for this molecule, we had a few green lights, we had some orange lights, and we had some red lights. So just to say that in order really to thoroughly investigate one single molecule does take time, does take resources, does take money. So we have to be, in a way, clever. And during the discussion we had uh, yesterday with, uh, with Kish and, uh, and Andrew, we said, well, for any drug we wish to develop, we still need a bit of luck. And it's very difficult to bet on that factor. But without it, again, it will be a difficult road. So again, any series can fail. And we have also, uh, as scientists in this field, to, to face that, uh, that reality, which means that we cannot put all our eggs in one single basket. We have to have basically alternate, alternate series. And uh, one of our lead candidates now, again, coming from Manaco, and it's a very similar structure to the one you just saw for sleeping, uh, you just see saw for sleeping sickness. And basically, it's a promising drug. I mean, in terms of efficacy, we are right now assessing its uh, safety profile. And we, again, if uh, we manage to pass this hurdle, we may have also a, a preclinical candidate in the, coming from that chemical, uh, chemical class. Again, partnership collaboration. Why so many PDPs are present in the field? One working on malaria, one working on TB. Uh, DNDI working on sleeping sickness and uh, Mala and, uh, and Chagas as well as, as Leash. I mean, could we, have, could we also find some sy synergy between all these PDPs? And maybe one of the most recent and striking one is the collaboration between DNDI and TB Alliance. Uh, TB Alliance has worked for many, many years on one chemical class, um, the, the nitroimidazoles, with the aim of developing a new drug candidate to fight TB. And basically, um, and the two organizations are at least partly, partly funded by the, the Gates Foundation, and it became quite clear that why working in silos? Why not trying to join forces and see whether one chemical class, which appears to have the potential to treat TB, 
could not be at least investigated to see whether it could be also an interesting class to treat another neglected diseases. So that was the, the basis of the, of the collaboration. And it does explain why, basically, I'm also collaborating with New Zealand, because the, the chemistry for this uh, collaboration uh, lies in uh, quite far away from everywhere else in the, in the world. But it's a very active group, very professional. And, and again, uh, as I said, I have been in this field for now close to four years, and this is the first time I'm in a way lucky enough to deal with a chemical series which has outstanding behavior. We, to start with, we screen 70 compounds. And from 70 compounds, basically 30, I mean almost 50% of them, provided IC50 in the in vitro model inferior to one Nano, 100 nanomolar. And again, for people uh, uh, not expert in this field, to date, the most, the most active compound uh, in this field was amphotericin B. Amphotericin B, IC50 is 70 nanomolar. So we are in the range of potency of amphotericin B. So we said, well, that's great. It's a good, uh, it's a good starting point. But what is more interesting, if you look at the in vivo profile, and again, just look at uh, at basically the inhibition rate provided in animal models. And again, this molecule, mainly that one, is basically as potent as ambisome, as effective as miltefosin in, uh, in this model. It has good PK profile, good bioavailability in a, in a mouse model. So, so far, back to my green light uh, aspect, I mean, this compound has all the, the needed features to become a, at least a preclinical candidate. And if Kish is willing to invite me a second time to this symposium in one year time, I'm really hoping that I will be able to present to you a full profile of this, uh, of this drug, which again, every, anything can fail, including that series. But so far, I mean, it's something uh, I'm quite excited about. Still, let's face it, it's still a very long road to go. I mean, we are somewhere there, lost in the middle of the, of the mountains, but we have already crossed a few, a few hurdles, and, but there are still uh, quite a few to, uh, to overcome before reaching the, uh, the IND. And even the IND will be a new start for assessing now the overall efficacy and safety of this drug in, uh, in human being. Right, just to finish up, money. Uh, it's, it's definitely not my field of, uh, of expertise, but um, I would say that it is uh, important. And for DNDI, what is important is to remain independent in terms of financement. So by bylaws, DNDI will not accept any funder to be over 25% of the overall uh, money we, we receive from external sources. So because we want to be able to keep our strategy independent of the, the money we, uh, we receive. So um, over the period of 10 years, 2004-2014, we estimate that we need about uh, 230 million euros, which depending on the conversion rate should be around uh, 300, uh, 300 million US dollars. Mm -hmm. And we have basically right now secured about 50% of it, which means we still have a, a gap to, uh, to fill. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we have main donors, as I was mentioning MSF, the Gates Foundation, but again, uh, some key uh, governments outside of Northern America again, and that's a big, uh, a big gap in the financements. And this is a problem of the NDI. This is a problem of most NGOs working in this field. We don't have access to sustained funding. Anything can be stopped, not from one day to the next, but at least from one year to the next. And it does basically pose a, a problem for all these organizations. And it could be, again, another big debate uh, outside of this, uh, of this room. So again, my final slide. Uh, that's the achievement in terms of number of treatments already delivered, both from the existing one as well as some uh, new chemical entities showing the, showing the light, basically. And uh, I would like to thank all of you, but also uh, through my presentation, thank all our partners, uh, without whom, basically, again, uh, everything we would be trying to do will not be a success. Thanks again. We have a few minutes for questions for, for Denis. Rebecca? Hi, I was just wondering if you could comment with respect to 
patents know how access to materials, access to data, whether or not intellectual property rights have been a barrier for GDI or other communities? I will express my personal opinion on that, <laughs> if you don't mind. IP is a problem restricting access to existing drugs. I mean, this is fairly obvious in the field of HIV. In my field, namely research, it's less of an issue. In other words, if I discover a, a class uh, which has been developed by even a, a, big, uh, a big farmer and I managed to see the, to show that this molecule could be of interest to treat leash or any of the neglected diseases. I would say that not one single farmer today will object to develop this molecule. Where there could be a, a grayish area, and this has, may, 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 might have been the case for, for Chagas, you have a, a good antifungal drug which is making billions on developed markets. And you come and say, well, the same, the exactly same drug could be a good drug for Chagas. Then IP could be an issue because the reaction of big farmers will be to say, hey, you are going to test my wonder drug in remote countries, in sick patients, you are going to generate safety data showing that this drug in this type of population could be whatever, cardiotoxic. And this may have a negative impact on my sales. So that's maybe, again, uh, expressing my opinion, the domain where it's still a bit grayish. Questions? Yes, sir. Have you encountered any um, signs of drug resistance? And uh, are, are there any approaches you're taking to address it? Well, Obviously, in the field of leash, um, uh, Shaim Sunda will be even in a better position than, than I am. Obviously, for VL, resistance to antimonial is well documented. Resistance to amphotericin B, well, basically, as far as I can tell, it's not proven yet. There is one aspect uh, which has, again, to be, to be analyzed, is that the actual efficacy or potency of amphotericin B is different in Asia and in Africa. For reasons I personally don't fully understand, I don't know if Shyam has, a, has an opinion on that, but definitely resistance to every single drug in theory is possible. For amphotericin B, due to the mechanism of action, let's say it's less likely, that's, but this being said, it can also occur. This is why DNDI has taken this approach of trying to develop combination therapy with drugs having different mechanisms of action with the idea that combining two drugs would further delay the occurrence of resistance. Yeah. Hi there, thank you. Uh, you asked a hypothetical question at the beginning about the quantity versus quality of partnerships. Um, and I was wondering if you did have any opinion on it. As I was saying, I, I don't have a, a strong opinion. I'm just observing the, the landscape. And again, what I have noticed over the many the past three years is more and more organization, uh, uh, I would say, appearing on the, on the radar. And the, the concern I would like to express is, in a way, are we sure that we are not going at the end of the road to compete, even unwillingly? But the amount of resources, namely money, is not going to increase tenfold or one hundredfold. And if you, we have ten times more players, how will the money be spread between these players? That's item one. Item two is coordination between all of these organizations. Because if you have basically a consortium base in Canada, a consortium base in, uh, in, uh, in the US, two or three consortiums in, uh, in, US, in, uh, in Europe, and partners in India and Africa, who is going to make sure that again, resources are going to be allocated in the appropriate manner and that we are not going to duplicate efforts throughout the world. So I'm just expressing a slight concern, which to my opinion has to be addressed, and I just don't know by whom, but quality versus quantity, it is still to me something which is worth put on the table and addressed before we see another round of 10 or 100 partners occurring in the field in the forthcoming two years. Yeah, yes, sir. And then, you may have mentioned of using a combinatorial therapy. 
that uh, an idea of using uh, old drugs or those combinatorial therapies, but the problem is that usually those drugs are of patent, which means that uh, they drive very little interest for pharma companies mm -hmm. to keep developing, developing that. How would you address that problem? But in a way, it's, uh, it's back to the point I quickly mentioned accessing what I called low-hanging fruits. And low-hanging fruits could be, in a way, again, two types. The type of drugs you, you mentioned, any drug which is already in the market, and I would say with or without a patent, as well as all the drugs which have been developed up to at least phase two, and which failed not for safety reasons, but for, uh, for, not for efficacy reasons, not for safety reasons, but for efficacy reasons, and then we could have a core of drugs on which we have already some information, mainly in terms of PK and, and safety. And if the, the mechanism of action is relevant for one of our diseases, then and then only we could quickly have some potential drug candidate. The, question, the problem is, again, it does take time because you have to approach every single pharmaceutical company to see whether they would be willing to open their safe to say, well, over the past 20 years, we have developed uh, 200 molecules and here they are with all the, the information and look and uh, see whether you could find something of interest. Bill? Um, you made it very clear that, that you just tried to facilitate access but clearly, as you've shown on your slide, for example, sleeping sickness, you've developed some collaborations in very difficult parts of the world to work in. Can you comment on the utility of those kinds of studies to, in fact, build the partnerships to facilitate access? In other words, it's, a, it's one way of getting into a community. Again, I mean, uh, and I don't have a, a strong opinion on that because it's a bit outside of my, of my field, but one comment, and back again to, to one of Nigel's comments, political will. I would say that mainly in these countries, without a, polit a strong political will, we will end up into a failure for, for, different, uh, for different reasons. The second aspect, we still have to rely on local network, and in these countries, networks just don't exist. I mean, we have to rely on organization like MSF, which basically is definitely committed to do something, but reaching a, a local community of about 100 people, almost in the middle of nowhere, in a very uh, politically unstable area, is difficult. So I, I don't have a clear answer to your question, for specifically for these countries, which are potentially, I mean, the most difficult, I mean, to, uh, to access. But even in, in India, where the situation is far, is far different, access remain, remains a problem for different reasons, could be cost. But it is also a physical aspect to remote, to remote areas where the first needs, even seen by the local authorities, is maybe not access to, to drugs. So um, that's why I said DNDI is not the, maybe the, the best organization to be the driver for this part, for the access part. But we tend to still build network and to, uh, to, t to liaise with local authorities to have someone, somebody, or some organization located in the country to do this job. Okay, we've got, uh, two more questions. Helen? Thank you. That was an impressive uh, presentation and a lot of good results. Um, I was uh, traveling in a, a country in Africa this summer, and one of the issues that uh, came out loud and clear was the issue of quality control of medications. And they're seeing uh, serious levels of resistance because uh, they're buying their medications from countries where it's either counterfeit or half strength antibiotics. And um, apparently, you know, even though they have the money for, for funding certain programs like antiretrovirals, they're now faced with this mm. huge problem of quality control. I was wondering mm. if you have uh, seen that. Oh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a problem throughout Africa for, I mean, I would say uh, uh, benign diseases as well as for, may if you go to any single market in Africa, you will find small stands with people saying, uh, selling capsules in plastic bags. 
And usually they are very colorful. You could buy a full bag and you end up with, you don't know what exactly what you, what you buy. I've seen also uh, vials containing uh, anti-malaria uh, compounds, supposedly in liquid formulations standing in the sun. So, and most of these drugs are coming from Nigeria. What can be done is again, back to political will. If the, the local health authority don't do anything, I mean, it will end up into, into a problem. And I mean, just I mean, to, to give a bit of, of humor on how to access these people, I was on vacation in Mali uh, four years ago, and I was just walking through the Dogon country, which was basically you have to walk hours before reaching a village. And the first thing I was offered when reaching the village was a bottle of Coke. And it's no joke. People were able to carry glass bottles of Coke for several hours. And I was wondering, well, what's the incentive for, for these people to carry heavy bottles of Coke for, on such a long way? It's money. Because they knew that sooner or later they will have tourists coming to this place and they would be able to make a few cents say, selling a bottle of Coke. And my idea was, say, well, if we need to reach these people, let's stick blisters on, of drugs on any bottle of Coke. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds crazy, but... Yeah, it made me think about, gee, Coca-Cola is able to reach the most remote part and drugs cannot. Now it's something odd. <laughs> so maybe we should join forces with, with Coca-Cola. I mean, that's... Uh... One last question to uh, Bob. So you've described a gigantic problem curing neglected diseases. And <coughs> there are many uh, partners, institutions, foundations and NGOs that are addressing this issue. So I guess the key question for a developing organization like ours is where are the gaps? Where, where, where are the greatest needs in this uh, continuum of discovery through to delivery into a, to people? Well, again, the, the gaps are almost, I would say, everywhere. Uh, we, are, we need new chemical entities. We need to have capacities to develop new drugs, and we need to develop access. So basically, the landscape is there. The gaps are there. And the question is basically from whatever exists today, is there still, in, t uh, in terms of this time of organization, are there still gaps that are not filled by all the existing organizations and all the existing consortia? Back to my point, do we have enough already and should we try to take to make a better use of the existing organizations, or do we need another round of organization still to fill the existing gaps? And again, to me, this is still a very open question. Well, uh, it's time for our coffee break, uh, but on behalf of the NGDI and the University of British Columbia, Denny, I just want to present you a, a token of our appreciation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Keith. All right.